welcome to long cut greetings of the day as law students all of us have actually thought how should i actually bridge the gap between what i learn in law school versus what the industry actually demands which are the newer emerging areas of law which can generate opportunities for me so to uh, address those questions who better than miss akanksha antil yeah akanksha antil uh, runs uh, her own legal talent management firm called to whom it may concern so and before this she worked as a legal recruitment head at sril amarchan mangal das before after graduating from the nalsar university of law so i think that this 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 show will add so much value not only to law students but also to young lawyers it will give them a whole new uh, in, insight as to what how the industry actually operates so uh, first of all ma'am how how are you how do you feel uh pretty good so be nervous also because i have been avoiding these interviews for the longest time so when you guys approached me i was very excited that uh, a bunch of uh, you know first year second year law students are doing this so i thought okay uh, maybe this is what i should start with so yeah excited and yet nervous right so ma'am firstly i really want to ask you why so uh, how is the journey with the uh, to whom it may concern has been uh, any challenges you faced and first of all what made you start such a venture okay i know this uh, name is slightly uh, difficult to just repeat again and again to whom it may concern i know it's a little different so you can call it twimsy it might uh, sound like a little dog's name but i i figured that that's the easiest way to call it so you can address it as twimsy um so you know uh, i've worked as a recruiter as a consultant for almost 10 years now so this idea popped in when i was still working at cam and uh, by that time i had already worked with bahura for good 5 years and after you know uh, working at bahura i realized that i definitely want to see how things function on the other side of the table right so as a recruiter you are always preparing uh, candidates preparing them for interviews training them how to write resumes but i definitely wanted to understand the perspective of the client what happens when we send the resume to the other side so that was a very exciting experience i got uh, you know trained by dr jaina ryan who's currently a ceo at indus and i got to work directly with mr and mrs shroff and it was a fantastic experience uh, so at cam i was dealing with multiple set of recruiters and i was also going to law schools for uh, as a panelist for day zero and i was a panelist for all the ppo interviews i managed their internships all those things so that's where i realized when it came to recruitment that there were a number of players in market however a lot of them were not really spending time to get to know their candidates as well and, and uh, the clients right so the way they should have because at bahura i was trained by uh, uh you know best in the industry uh these guys lee ignatius and uh, rithvik lucas fantastic people and they they train me how you should take care of your candidate and the client right so i thought that was really a miss in market and i of course understand it client's perspective as well from there so i decided that i will start something which is very quality driven and not quantity driven even if i send like you know say three candidates to a firm they should be people who the firm really uh, wants and they they fit in their requirements really well and also from the candidate's perspective my candidate should be really happy and that should be their long term background for next few years whenever you know for however long they decide to be there so the idea was to get the right match between the candidates and the client so that was the recruitment perspective coming to the training bit when i went to law schools for the day zeros and the ppo interviews i realized that students were still making same mistakes that we were making back in 2000 it came to resume writing interview training and all that so they were still giving silly answers to what are your strengths and weaknesses tell us about yourself and these are really basic questions and you keep wondering like why do why does anyone ask me these questions however these questions are very very important and it helps firm realize that if you are the right fit for them or not also there was no formal course on resume writing as such bahura really trained me well for this uh, this particular job of resume writing because i saw like thousands and thousands of resumes of lawyers from fresher level to partner level 
So I decided that, okay, uh, combining my experience of uh, Vahura and CAM, let me just uh, prepare a module for law students where I can train them in resume writing, interview training, also how to go about uh, conducting themselves in internships, how to prepare for their presentations, all those things. And that's where I decided to come up with to whom it may concern. Right. And just to add on to it, uh, I mean, at Narsar, I mean, I'm sure many of uh, the, your batchmates there, you know, they must be getting jobs from, they must be going for litigation or working in-house or working under a senior advocate. So didn't you feel that, okay, uh, I should do this, law, why didn't I go in law? So that way, how did you choose legal recruitment over actually working in the law? So it didn't happen suddenly. Uh, I never fell in love with law while being at law school. I landed in law because I was escaping the science at that point of time. When I went to law school, there was immense learning. There were some subjects I loved, but overall, uh, I didn't turn in law firms and corporate houses. But I realized that that's not something that really excites me. So by the end of law school also, I hadn't figured out uh, I figured out that what I didn't want to do, but I still hadn't figured out what I really wanted to do. And I, I was lucky enough that I had that luxury of figuring it out after the law school also. One thing I knew that I'm not going to go back home. And uh, so I'm from Sonipat. I knew that I can't just go back to Sonipat. So I stayed put in Delhi. I tried my hand at judicial services coaching. So that, that experience was fantastic because till that time, we were in the shell of national law school students. Whereas the moment I went to these judicial services, uh, judicial service coaching classes, it was fantastic because I got to meet students from majorly from uh, universities like Delhi University, Punjab University, whose sole aim of doing law was to crack one of the government service exams. So at that point of time, I realized that I love talking too much and socializing too much. So judicial services is not my cup of tea. Not, I'm not saying that I would have definitely cracked it, but I never wrote any exam. But I definitely realized that, okay, this is also out of uh, picture. But I didn't. Uh, and then I uh, tried, uh, I not tried, I did work with Central Information Commission under Mr. Shailesh Gandhi. That was a fantastic experience as well. So... All this while, I didn't realize that all these things will come handy when I will be training other people, uh, you know, uh, training law students or helping people from different backgrounds and deciding what their next job should be. So, yeah, I mean, uh, it took me almost one year to figure out that I want to do legal recruitment. So while I was at Central Information Commission, one of my friends from college who was a junior, she told me about this company called Rainmaker and how they had come to college and how they're into legal recruitment. They help lawyers find their next jobs and they also train law students. So it was uh, the love at very first sound of it. And I knew that this is what I'm supposed to do. You know, I love talking. I love meeting new people. And uh, I'm already familiar with the law industry as such. So I thought, okay, this, uh, I think stars were aligned for me at that point of time, as Seemandi would have said. So, yeah, I mean, it was... It was a perfect match and that's how I landed in legal recruitment. So there weren't so many options. There weren't so much information on the internet about these are the various options. Uh, if you don't want to go to a, a law firm, corporate house, or you don't want to litigate. So I had my own struggles and that have really helped me in preparing these modules for law students as well. And I can understand them better because I've been through those struggles myself. So yeah, that's how I stumbled on legal recruitment. <laughs> Great, fantastic. Uh, digging a bit into what you actually do. So, like, as in, as in the work of Quimsy, hmm. uh, tell us how, how does the, how, how do we, you assess or any firm assesses a, a student based on his CV and uh, do they actually read the entire CV or uh, like, uh, like <laughs> as we see in the uh, model, uh, what you call the questionnaire sessions that are available on YouTube that tell us something about yourself and then they say that my name is say Rajas and they say that but that that, 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 that is already in your CV we want something that is not in your CV so like how, how does that function so uh, uh, you know lawyers have a flair for reading and catching errors okay 
and uh, so trust me they all go through your resume they might do it like uh, two minutes right before your interview but they will go through it and that's why you know resume writing or uh, filling in your questionnaire properly is a skill in itself because people don't really pay uh, you know spend more than 40 seconds reading your resume and they will I think take out maximum a minute and a half to go through your questionnaire. So, but do they go through your resume? Absolutely, they go through your resume. They go through it word by word. So that's why I keep telling my students that it's very important for you to make a resume which is so easily readable and it should pack a punch in those two pages so that they can read it easily and absorb all the information about you and figure out who you are. And see, going by resume, what can they really assess you on? They can figure out the kind of internships you have done, the kind of academics you've had, the kind of co-curricular and extracurricular activities you have indulged in, what kind of interest you have. So that in itself is enough for first impression because if you have good academic record, good internships and some co-curricular and extracurricular activities, it shows me that you're dynamic. You have managed to balance your academics along with your other activities and you're clearly hardworking, right? And these skills are non-negotiable. Anyone who is your prospective recruiter wants you to be hardworking and technically sound. This is something that they can figure out. How you perform in the interview are the other things that they assess. You know, will you be a cultural fit for the firm? How are your communication skills? Because they're drafting your drafting skills they've assessed based on your resume and questionnaire. But how are your uh, interview uh, sorry communication skills? Uh, what are your long terms long term plans? Uh, how do you assess different situations? What are your problem solving uh, skills? All these things are figured out in the interview. So, you know, I know your question was, uh, do they go through it? Yes, they go through it. And as I said in the beginning that describe yourself is, is extremely important that if you can't talk about yourself, what else will you talk about, right? So this seems like a silly question and a very irritating question that, you know, tell me about yourself and then you start with my name is so and so. And of course, they're going to tell you, I've just, you know, so say, you know, I've, I've already welcomed you in the interview room and I've said, hi, Rajas, come and take a seat. And then you start with, hi, I'm Rajas. And I'll be like, I already know your name. Why are you repeating your name? Then you'll say, I am from this college. And I'll, and I'll tell you that I'm sitting in your campus. So of course, I know which college are you from. So this is their way of testing you. How do you respond under pressure? How can you talk about yourself? So communication skills, presentation, how do you perform under pressure? All those things are assessed by these simple questions. They seem very simple, but they are definitely complicated. Right. Wonderful. I mean, I mean, it is a common human error. I mean, if they are sitting in your campus and you still tell them which college you are from, then I mean, that is the limit of it, right? I mean, okay, so no, I, tell them, I, I tell them that, uh, you know, say if, uh, um, say if, if I've gone to Nalsar and you say, hi, I'm uh, so and so, I'm a Kangsha and I'm in fourth year of Nalsar. Unless you're from NLS or NUJS and you're yet sitting in Nalsar, I don't think you need to tell me that because that'll be very interesting if you're from a different college and sitting for campus recruitment in another college. So, you know, these are little ways of... Uh, pulling their legs and seeing how they how they respond to you know your responses so it's just about that so yeah it seems very obvious but i understand from students perspective that it's not easy You're so nervous these things come out of your mouth very naturally yeah i mean we can't actually control what uh, happens in the heat of the moment right so i think that is what so moving forward uh, Let's take a deep dive into CV, okay? What are the main common mistakes which students do while drafting their CV? And, you know, uh, you know, as the legal industry is actually changing, I mean, each and every month, it change, changes. So, you know, how should we equip ourselves? You know, what should be there in that CV to actually, you know, one is able to actually serve yeah. the industry? So, uh, see, your... Uh if you want to get recruited by the best of the places, you have to have the best of the CV. Okay. That is non-negotiable. So how do you have best of the CV? Your academics are the topmost priority. You know, when I was in law school, I also used to act cool by saying, oh, you know, but grades are not reflection of my intelligence. 
trust me, they're definitely a reflection of your intelligence and your hard work. Okay, so that's why it's non-negotiable. So if I know that, you know, you have scored well in college, it shows that, you know, you've paid attention to your subjects and you know how to respond. And of course, you've worked hard to score well. Also, if you say that, oh, no, I couldn't score, but I know everything. But there are so many other students within your batch and a lot of students across law schools who have managed to score very well and also have like multiple activities in their resume, be it mood codes, debates, publications, and whatnot. So how do you make yourself stand out? So the first, and you've seen a lot of top law firms, it's the easiest filter for them. They'll say that, you know, send us resume of top 30 students because it's just the easiest way. They can't go through 100 resumes and filter them because you can imagine the number of law schools who are sending applications to them. Nobody has that kind of time. So it's an easiest filter. So it's important that you take care of your academics. Then is your internships. You have to have a good set of internships. And nobody wants you to have only law firm internships in your resume for you to get selected. That's a big myth. Uh, you, All the people who are interviewing you have also been law students at some point of time, right? And all of us have been part of that curriculum where we know that you have to start with an NGO internship. And then you move to, say, a trial court and a high court or Supreme Court, then to a corporate house or a law firm, that kind of thing. So if you think that, you know, just throwing all the law firm internships will make me an eligible candidate, that's not really true. Because people will ask you that you, you know, there are uh, students who will say that, oh, no, I knew I was meant for uh, only doing corporate law from my school days. That sounds a little unbelievable. But okay, if you're one of those students, that's great. However, you haven't even bothered trying what are the various other fields to come to this decision, right? So automatically, you know, we look for people who have tried out everything and have come to a sensible decision. Then next is your uh, co-curricular activities, which can be anything. Not everyone has to have mood codes. Not everyone has to have publications. You play on your strengths, right? And populate your resume uh, with things that you really enjoy doing. Then, how, you know, there are extracurricular activities. So, you know, figure out what you enjoy doing and put those there. If you've participated in something, those are the activities that will go there. Uh, your positions of responsibility and all that. And the last bit is your uh, interests and hobbies that I'm a big fan of because, you know, these interviews are intense uh, uh, you know, an intense exercise in itself. So a lot of students ask me that if I should put interests and hobbies in my resume, it's very important because that really sets you apart, right, from everyone else. Because if you look at any law school resume, law school student resume, they all have internships, they all have academics, they all have um, mm -hmm. curriculars, extracurricular. So, you know, your, uh, your schooling, where did you do your schooling from, which city you're from, and your hobbies and interests, can in the resume, okay? So if I'm from Sonipat and I see some student who is from Sonipat, right? Immediately, there'll be a connection. So uh, the ice is broken and the atmosphere in the interview room is slightly less intense. So it'll help you. So similarly, your interest, if you're interested in photography and I'm interested in photography, immediately I'll ask you, so what kind of photography do you enjoy? Do you use your phone? Do you use a DSLR? This or so automatically you'll also relax because you'll know that it's not, uh, uh, there's not a monster sitting across the table who's going to grill you left, right, center. Yeah. So you are giving them, uh, you know, little bits and pieces for making that atmosphere comfortable. So, these hey, uh, so uh, moving ahead, uh, like the, the next question is that uh, now there are, uh, because of this pandemic, we have got to know that there are different avenues which uh, law can enter into. And I guess, uh, like many people say that uh, virus is not here to stay, but I feel that maybe virus is not here to stay, but maybe the new avenues are for sure. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, so the question is based on if, uh, if students should focus on these new avenues more, will they result in better employability and uh, or, or is the conventional space having enough space already like to accommodate uh, the amount of graduates? Mm. So see, it's, it'll be very helpful if you're aware of new avenues and you're updated about, uh, you know, 
uh, about what really is happening in market what practice areas are picking up um, like anything tech is really in right now right and it is going to be there for quite some time now beat edutech um, you know and trust me all practice areas will continue to function so it's not like they will change it's not like everyone will join tmt practice because of this and nobody will join mna so you know as a practice you have to be updated that okay these are the areas that are flourishing and probably these are the areas that i should keep an eye out for but firms when they continue to, you know when they will hire they will continue to hire in a similar fashion all this will have an impact on financing like the financing of late has really picked up because uh, you know because of the liquidity crunch yeah so there has been uh, massive salary issues but yet people you know all these corporate houses have to pay their people because of which they are financing so financing sector has picked up so there will be work in different practice areas there will be some uh, areas like real estates where some projects will get delayed those things will happen so you know uh, some will be slightly slower but for law firms you know there is always work for lawyers but you have to understand uh, how will it impact students right so if there are law firms they have clients the clients are giving them work but if the clients are hit by the uh, you know the whole covid situation and there's financial crunch they'll automatically ask you for a discount so if you're working on discounted rates you can't expect to pay everyone within the firm the same salaries that you could and it's a fair enough point right and uh, of course the work is also lesser uh, now how will that impact the lower rung which is the students that the number of students they would hire would have hired in the normal course they won't be doing so because say batch of 2020 is going to be joining in probably 2021 so the next batch can't be joining in july or august the way it used to be in normal course right so you can't have a zeros with a gap of 6 months so of course from the batch of uh, 2021 lesser people would be hired and then it might have an impact on the next batch also so of course these are markets that you know if they go down they also bounce back so the course correction will happen eventually but in we will see some kind of impact in next one or two years but yeah you know hiring will still carry on but uh, students will have to uh, hone their skills and become smarter because competition will increase so they will have to figure out you know how do i stand out better than other others in the lot yeah sure thank you great so with this we come to the next fun segment which which we really look forward to this is called on your finger tips which is kind of similar to a rapid rapid fire round so uh, without any further okay so as you mentioned earlier if not to whom it may concern what would you name pmc um i think i always thought of funny names and uh, alternate <laughs> alternate name that i thought of was nd which is e n d i uh i thought was short and simple and it actually comes from a haryanvi term uh, which is nd the word which means basically fantastic so yeah that was the alternate name i'm glad that i stuck to to whom it may concern i'm glad you i mean you so came up ridiculous. with something unique i mean nowadays there are startups startups emerging they have names they compulsory you need to have lex or just or something legal in it i mean I mean that is too boring to. Uh, it's um, well, my uh, husband and his partner have a firm which starts with Lex, which is quite unfortunate. Yeah. <laughs> sorry But, to say, sorry. No, 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 not at all. I think you should keep this because I told them the same thing. I was like, oh my god, another Lex, and I'll kill myself. But uh, they liked it, and they said that it works for uh, works with clients. So so be it. But I was very anti-lex and anti-legal, so I, so one of my friends who are not even lawyers, um, they are from advertising, and was just sitting with them, and they were coming up with names, 
and they said that you know when we think of lawyers we think of stamp papers and notices and they say to whom it may concern so and then you automatically think it's some kind of legal document so i was like that's perfect i mean they it sounds perfect to me so and it is for anyone and everyone so it can be interpreted in way different manner so yeah i mean but yeah my husband's uh, firm's name is still lex <laughs> consult so yeah it is one of the legs yeah i mean yeah but still one uh, good sign is that you know when you name something like that you know lex in latin means legal so i mean people come to know that yeah it is something to do with the law so i mean yeah that helps kind of the clients also you know it's okay i mean don't worry <laughs> i'm not taking it otherwise so you don't have to cover it up now no no i have not covered it i'm on the same page as you are so it's okay Okay. Anyway, so moving but forward. Again, again, but but if if trademark uh, you know trademark commissioner is somewhere <laughs> watching this, then you need to work out on how many lexes are allowed in India now. Absolutely. <laughs> anyway, anyway. Okay. So moving forward, you know some students are very nervous when it comes to giving interviews, but some students are very confident. They end up giving some wittiest, some funniest answers. So I mean. you have been interviewing and recruiting law students from like 9 10 years now so i mean uh, what were the funniest and the wittiest answers you have ever got in an interview See, it's very difficult for me to remember the funniest one because honestly like when you inter- interview like uh, i don't know like thousands of people it sort of you know it doesn't really stick to your brain but i think every month every week there's always that one student who will entertain you to no end so there are things that students have said in the interview which i probably can't even say it in this interview so interview you mentioned that uh, sorry yeah uh, you didn't actually i mean you were quite quite clear that okay i don't want to do something in the law so l- let me still ask you this question anyway what was the most boring subject you encountered in the- Encountered in law school, most boring subject. Oh no no no! I I won't say that. <laughs> I think legal methods. That was. Uh, oh yes. Yeah. Yes. I think Heyman will give Definitely you a virtual high five students. at this. You know. <laughs> anyway. So, ma'am, uh, any one of your favorite non-law book? So, the all-time favorite is the uh, picture of Dorian Gray. The portrait. Uh, the picture of Dorian Gray. So, that's my all-time favorite book. Uh, other uh, now we don't get it, but otherwise, uh, I used to absolutely love Chacha Chaudhary. Uh, you know. genre of uh, comics as well but uh, yeah i think i go on the extreme sides either it's this or like completely something non relevant but yeah i think uh, mm-hmm. other than chacha chaudhry's uh, the picture of dorian gray is my favorite oh, but i went through your ig profile as well i mean you uh, your profile is no less than any anyway we'll cut it's that. like a catalog Yeah, catalog. Yeah, been to many countries. So, of them, which has been your favorite country? I honestly haven't been to so many countries, but the, uh, I mean, I know. Uh, once you've been to Europe, people think that okay, that's the place that that should be on everyone's list. But honestly, uh, my favorite place is called Koh Samui in Thailand, and Koh the Samui. new favorite. For uh, Nusa Penida, I really love both these places, and I feel that uh, just uh, in terms of food, in terms of people, these guys are much warmer, very hospitable. For me, you know, I think people make the place right, so it is very important how the people are because in European countries, I've seen that some people can be very stuck up, and that sort of takes away from the charm of the place that you're in um and every time i've been to these two places uh, experience has been phenomenal 
So yeah, these two are my favorite places. Right, great. Okay, moving forward. That's a completely, you know, a very unique choice. Like whenever, uh, generally we've asked this to quite people and they have like, all of them are like Paris, New York. You know, once every year we'll try to go to Thailand and it's just so simple. I mean, that island, Kosama, you, you guys should probably Google it. It's, it's fantastic. It's beautiful. Uh, it's got amazing food. So there's nothing not love there. One that we discovered last year, Nusa Penita, uh, that gave me an idea how Goa would have been before it got infested with tourists. It was that beautiful, that pristine. I don't think they know what poly bags are or plastic is because those beaches are untouched. So there's no construction that is there. So, you know, it can be very touristy, but these are. These are very, very beautiful places. I mean, I feel very lucky that before they also got infested with tourists, at least I've been there. So, right. And I think, uh, like, I hope someday some guest will say that his or her favorite is Wuhan, <laughs> China. <laughs> I don't think that's happening anytime soon. <laughs> uh, the last thing, I mean, ma'am, you have done every single thing. You have, right from law school, you have been experimenting a lot different avenues of learn. Also, you've been traveling to many places. So, I mean, I just really want to ask you any two things in your bucket list. See, I, I don't have like major, major plans for anything as such, but I think there are just two things uh, in my bucket list uh, that have been there on some uh, for some time. Uh, actually, one has always been there. Other one is just something that I'm learning. Uh, going to Italy and spending at least a month is on my bucket list. Uh, I was supposed to do that in March, not a month, but 20 days. And thanks to coronavirus, that never materialized. So that remains on my bucket list. And other thing is more of a lifestyle change that I want to bring. That is just be as minimalistic as possible. Again, I think because of uh, this whole COVID situation, uh, I mean, it just taught me that, okay, you know, you have so many unnecessary things in your life, which you won't, which you'll never need uh, if there's some kind of an urgent situation. So it's made me realize that, okay, there's plenty of money that's, that gets wasted here and there. So on my bucket list, I know it's not a bucket list item, but I think that's one of the things I want to achieve in life is just uh, become as minimalistic as possible. I, th I think that sounds too philosophical. It's just uh, not a bucket list thing, but I think these are the only two things that are playing on my mind because uh, that Italy trip got cancelled, so that keeps playing on my head. So that'll remain on my bucket list, and uh, this is something that I've recently figured. So yeah, I guess with this uh, this very fortunate opportunity of ours has come to an end, wherein we got to you know, interact with one of the leading uh, the creators in the legal industry as far as, at least in India. And uh, I guess uh, th this is, this was very enlightening in, in several ways because employment is like the end goal for most of the law students, if not uh, excluding a very few. Of them. So I guess this uh, helps, uh, I hope this helps a lot of uh, other students as well who, who all are watching this. I, I, I would like to, you know, Sincerely, thank you on behalf of each and every member of uh, Team Law. Thanks a lot. Thank you. I had a super fun time too.